Let's go. I'm gonna do a soft entry and then I'll introduce you. Right. you. How do you want me to? I'm gonna say the founder of Black Guns Matter. Yep. Anything else? Just awesome. Jim. Awesome yeah. and just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are rolling into another episode of the Candace Owens Show, and I want to talk about the Second Amendment because it always seems to be debated in America, which is strange considering the founding of this country. Here to discuss all things Second Amendment with me, I am sitting with Maj Toure. Welcome to the Candace Owens Show. What's up, Candace Owens? Is Hi, it? What's up, show? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to have you here. You are the founder of an organization called Black Guns Matter, yeah. which I will take to be a play off of Black Lives Matter. Am Absolutely. I correct in that? Absolutely. Tell me about it. So, one, um, when we started this organization at the time, it was 2015 going into 2016 into the presidential elections. Um, we kept see, we kept hearing about Black Lives Matter, um, and I think where they were coming from. First of all, I know the origin of that organization, um, the Ferguson movement, um, you know, and and so that movement actually got co-opted. The founders of Black Lives Matter wound up like selling Google gave them like a half a million dollars and all these different things. Now, whatever, get your money. I'm not tripping. Um, at the end of the day, though, I don't really need. I don't care if somebody else thinks my life matters. I, what you think, I don't care about. Um, but my black guns protect my life. They protect my children. They protect my family, my loved ones. And so for me, it was like, you know, everybody was like, yo, we need a voter's registration drive around that time. And um, I was like, yo, we need a license to carry drive because all of my friends keep catching possession charges, you know? And so we were like, yo, let's do an event called Black Guns Matter. And was, Black Guns Matter was supposed to be one event. And uh, we did the event and way too many people came, way too many people. And they were like, um, people from Brooklyn, it was in Philly. People from Brooklyn, Jersey, it was like, yeah, how do I get my license to carry? I'm like, well, bro, first, you're in a different municipality. And so that made us think like, yo, people really generally don't know how to do it lawfully. How to, and then we can change the laws because I believe that a tremendous amount of them are very unconstitutional. But um, we were just like, yo, why don't we just do like 13 cities, like the 13 colonies, and let's raise 25 grand on GoFundMe, and let's just do it. We did it, and... Uh, we started getting bombarded with emails from people saying like, yo, you, you're a horrible person. You didn't come to our city. You don't care about the people. I'm like, bro, I just like gave away 25 grand to do this to keep the classes free. And so um, we kept going. Um, we did a 50 state tour. Um, then we finished that and thought we was going to be done. And everybody's like, you're horrible because you only went to big cities. You didn't come to small towns. And we was like, yo, why don't we just raise the goal? Because the goal went from 25 grand to 100 grand to 250 and then we was like, yo, why don't we just raise a million dollars? And everybody was like, no one's going to get I'm like, nobody, we didn't think anybody was going to give us 100 grand. And so uh, that's where we're at now. So that was the roundabout way of saying that's how we started. But it's definitely a play on Black Lives Matter. If you believe that your black life matters, or if you, as a European American, whatever, Spanish American, if you believe that black lives or whatever life matters, you should have the means to defend them. Now, this is interesting. So you did this, uh, you said, during 20, 2015. Mm -hmm. And I remember during that time, there was a lot of rhetoric talking about having to take the guns away. We actually still see that today as a platform. Many politicians think that we should be moving the opposite direction. Yeah. Forget black guns, white guns, Hispanic guns. But there's this big call all of a sudden to say that all of the guns need to come back. There should be a buyback program from the government. Um, how do you respond to that? So one, the people saying that aren't really anti-gun. They more, because me, I'm not really a gun dude. I'm a freedom dude, you know? And so those people saying that, they fall into two categories. One, they have no information about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, American history. Um, and in that, if they don't have any, any understanding of American history, they probably don't have any understanding of world history. Um, every time there's been a de-arming of the population, not long after it, it there's been, you know, massacres. You're looking at Venezuela, you're looking at, you know, Mao, you're looking at all of these different places. That's just, I don't care what ethnicity you have. That is world history. So those people are either ignorant of that, and that caveat, that ignorance runs in alignment with their ignorance of firearms too. So when you hear a guy saying, this is a fully loaded clip, this is a blah, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. So um, that's that ignorant person. The other person that's pushing for very anti-freedom agendas um, are very racist. Um, are like control freaks that want people to do exactly what they want them to do. And it's like, I don't have to do what you want me to do if I'm strapped. I'm willing to die about mine. And I think there's nothing more patriotic and American than that. I think that the problem becomes 
they're targeting or they have been targeting um, massive urban areas because those are the biggest amounts of population. Gun control is not about safety. Gun control and any politician that says it, that's your litmus test. If they're not down with the Second Amendment, they don't understand the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Um, gun control is not about safety or preserving life or improving Americans' quality of life. It's about control flat out. That's why it's always in urban centers where there's always the most amount of melanated beings. That is a, that's not an accident. All gun control from its origin to its inception to its manifestation to its execution is racist. All of it. Okay, well, <clears throat> let, me play, let me play devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. Everything that you're saying, it's, it's a bit insensitive to say that when we have so many people that are fearful to send their children to school. Mm -hmm. Because once you say that anybody can get armed, what you're doing is you're threatening so the, these young kids who are going to school who are now wearing clear backpacks because of mass shootings. Mm -hmm. How can you stand on this platform given this huge dilemma that we're having in America with so much gun violence? So it's twofold to that. <laughs> So when the, devil, when the devil shows up and has an advocate, too, I love it. Um, one is statistically incorrect. Mass shootings um, account for less than... Now, let me be very clear before I say this. I don't care who dies, how many people die. If it's an idiot with a firearm killing people, I, I would love for somebody to be there to put a bullet right in their face first. I'm going to be very clear about that. Um, with that being the case, in defense of life and liberty. With that being the case, if one person dies in a mass shooting or the definition of it, um, that's too many. On top of that, the mass shootings that mass media talks about, they make up for less than 1% of all deaths all the time. Then they forget to also neglect to mention that this mass shooting problem that they're talking about, it, it started to spike under legislation that was created by Joe Biden. Gun-free zones were created in 1990 by Joe Biden. They became into law by Bill Clinton under that whole lock the black people up, Clinton crime bill stuff. Um, and since then, since gun-free zones were enacted, over 90% of those mass shootings are in gun-free zones. So you're saying criminals don't respect the signs that say gun-free zones? You, who would have knew? <laughs> that's, that's, that's really bizarre to me. Yeah, it's, it's like... It's so rude of them to not see the sign and be like, you know what, guys, we can't shoot it up in here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was going to commit a crime, but this says no crime. Clearly, I'm tripping. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so the problem is it's been the left has way better PR than we do on the right. They have to because they don't have substance. You got to hit them with the flash and bang when you don't have no actual, you know, facts and data. So they're very good at manipulating the stats. They'll say 30, 40,000 deaths a year are gun related, neglecting the fact that 60 percent of those are suicides, neglecting the fact that all of those mass shooters that they're talking about, the vast majority of those guys are on psych meds. But we can't have a conversation about the pharmaceuticals. I'm, I'm big into having the conversation on the pharmaceuticals. I always say when there is a mass shooting, um, I think it's one of the biggest contributors that nobody is talking about, which yep. is mental health. Yep. Um, and I, I mean, just being, um, just growing up and seeing how quickly doctors are willing to prescribe you anything. And I always tell the story of I had a really bad breakup when I was in college and I thought my entire world was ending. Yeah. And I went to the doctor and I was crying really, really hard. I was 18 years old and he was like, Xanax. I was like, yo. <laughs> Wow. Not just chocolate in like some movies, bro? Like. <laughs> Xanax for a breakup? Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about, and you're right. It's a conversation that people are not comfortable having because right. we live in a society that is very unique to American society mm -hmm. that over-prescribes for absolutely everything. Now I want to switch here and ask yeah. you a question. Black guns matter. Mm -hmm. Somebody might say that black guns is actually an issue right now in America because we have people that represent 13% of the population mm -hmm. committing over 40% of all the homicides every year. And gun mm -hmm. violence, black on black crime is huge. Over 94% of black Americans that are killed are killed by other black people. Mm -hmm. Do you not see your organization as feeding the problem as opposed to helping it? Absolutely not. We, we solve the problem, and that's, that's scalable. We've, we've done the research and data. For example, that 2015 to 2016, before we started this, the actual tour going to different cities mm -hmm. uh, for Black Guns Matter, we did the bulk of our classes in Philadelphia, at the same location, but the vast majority it was firearm safety, conflict resolution. So the whole year of 2016 goes by. 2017 happens. The stats come out for 2016. 
Philadelphia had the, lo- the lowest violent crime that it had had since 1979. I, I moved to Chicago for a month, uh, 2018, just to do conflict resolution, no gun related. The goal was we're going to go here. I think it might have been Labor Day or Memorial Day, where it's traditionally like a really bloody weekend in Chicago. I stayed there for a month, just handing out conflict resolution kits, south side, nighttime, no cameras, no nothing. That weekend's no homicides. Wow. The areas where there's less respect for the Second Amendment, that means they create more legislation. The legislation is what makes it safe for the bad guy because it's like, one, I know that I'm the bad guy, most of y'all are the good guys. Mm. Nobody's going to return fire. That's number one. Number two, the people that do have firearms, um, in whichever way they get them, some people lawfully, some people unlawfully, but their intent is to protect themselves. Now, because it's a taboo conversation, especially in the hood, you're not going to, you think if you go to a range, you're going to go to jail. So you don't have that conversation. Now you're not getting educated. Now you leave your firearm around because the movies told you you're supposed to leave it under the pillow. Now you don't know anything about proper firearm storage. Now when we have that two, three-year-old that shoots themselves in the face, because that's how most children do it, the gun is not, their fingers aren't large enough, so they turn it backwards so their thumbs can grab it. And that's why they shoot themselves in the face most times. Because you didn't want to be educated about it because you thought it was taboo because we didn't open up the conversation. In the early, in the, the 90s, the nation had serious problems with teen pregnancy. It was all over the place. We didn't like ban sex. But we didn't like we stop. Didn't? No. Thankfully. I got some really <laughs> hot girls in my DM. <laughs> um, we didn't ban sex. We just had conversations about educating people. Teen pregnancy dropped. The problem is to have the conversation about um, firearm safety, it's a Pandora's box for some of them tyrants. Because if I open this conversation about education and not making it taboo and more people are understanding of that, the rabbit hole is now Declaration of Independence. Why are so many of these gun guys saying, you know, this, this whole Bill of Rights thing? And then you start researching that. Now you can't unplug, you can't plug that person back into that matrix. And you do not want, again, all gun control is racist. When the concept was started, it was to make sure that people of color did not have the means to protect themselves, flat out. Um, and if that uh, changes a little bit in how it looks on the surface, the intent and the agenda is still the same. So when you see 40-something percent of the black-on-black crime happening, I want to talk about that real quick, too. Crime is proximity. White-on-white crime exists. Mm. We just don't have a term for it. We don't just say white on white crime or Spanish on Spanish crime, cartel on cartel crime, you know, Irish on Irish crime. They do that to continue to marginalize people to justify not the fact that, you know, um, their gun control isn't working to justify the fact that it isn't and say, well, it's just because you guys are just genetically predisposed, you know, have a genetic predisposition to kill each other. And that's again, the left has very good PR. All of the places Mostly right. Sorry to my friends on the left. All of the places that have less gun restriction, more respect for proper safety, knowledge, training and storage have lower rapes, lower homicides, lower violent crime. Okay, so you identify as a libertarian Mm -hmm. and you recently ran for city council. Um, Tell me a little bit about that process, what it was like running as somebody who is, first off, running in Philadelphia, a major inner city, someone that is unapologetically pro-2A, and um, you didn't run, as most people would assume, because of the color of your skin, that you would be on the left, but you ran as a libertarian. How was that process for you? Um, I learned a lot. Um, I learned how... uh, I, again, I still have friends and family that's on the left and right. I love everybody uh, except my enemies. Um, I just think that when you run as a as a third party candidate, I ran because of the fact that I have libertarian the philosophy. I'm in alignment with it. Libertarian dudes are about freedom, like liberty. Like they like nah, you you're not taking my guns, my property rights, my these things. Philly's the birthplace of America. I'm from Philly, you know. The, we got a bell, like, named after liberty. You know what I'm saying? Um, but a lot of my friends across the country are Republicans. For a very long time, I was a registered Republican. Very long time. Even longer than that, I was a Democrat growing up. But if you do any type of actual, like, research and study, okay, so Dr. King just happened to be a Republican. And just So he's not the racist. Oh, okay, we're going to leave him out of the conversation. 
you know. Um, and so explaining that to my demographic um, is a little bit more difficult because of that same left PR. If I go Republican, they go, oh, you, a, you know how it is. Oh, you a sellout. Yeah. I, you, you DM and Donald Trump Jr. is on your page, Maj, you're a sellout. No, he's a nationally ranked shooter. And he's, he's got really cool Gucci loafers. Like, <laughs> like, come on, bro. Like, stop it. Like, everything isn't this thing. So saying this to say, breaking it down from my perspective, if I go hard right, even if my principles, my conservative values, and my liberty-based values are all packaged up in one being. It's easy to translate that um, outside of the political process. Now, going through running for city council, I recognize that there's a serious uh, attempt. First of all, I needed three times the amount of signatures to get on the ballot than the Democrats did. They needed 1,000. I needed 3,200. I got 10,000 signatures just in case they wanted to play themselves, right? However, which means if 10,000 people in my hood give me their signature to get me on a ballot, that means 10,000 people like what you're about. Now, that's a, that's a modicum. That's a small microcosm of the macro, but still, it's something there. What I learned about the process, though, in an 80% Democrat city, the level of bullying that I was getting wording from all day at the polls, there are people from the Democratic Party, the, the, the party that, again, these are my friends and family. And I am empathetic to them because that's my community. I understand that they still plugged into the matrix, though. My friends and family and the pollsters were being told they love me. I'm voting for Maj. They're being told, no, you just hit D all the way down. One is illegal. That's number one, unlawful. That's number one. Number two, it's just corny. I'm not trying to remove like all Democrats, all Republicans. This America, like, um, with its contradictions, this America experiment is an experiment in diversity and freedom. Yo, you want to slather yourself up with butter on Wednesdays? Cool, do it in your crib. That's your thing. I'm not, I'm not, but you can. Cool. That's freedom. I don't have to agree with it. I don't, you don't have to be Republican. You don't have to be libertarian. I'm not calling for the smashing end of the Democratic Party. I'm going to tell the truth about what you did, though. The truth is the truth. I'm not attacking you because there's still people attached to it. So they're telling friends and family and loved ones, and they texting me like, yo, they told me I got to just push the D. Is that true? And I'm like, nah, it's not true. It's actually unlawful. Tell them you're going to go get, you know, someone to oversee this situation and they'll leave you alone. Unequivocally, everybody, oh, they did leave me alone. Right. Um, I saw the bullying process. You know, I saw the, the, the game to set up. You, why, why me as a libertarian or a third party candidate? Why do I need three times the amount of signatures? Does that like make people smarter? Does it end poverty? Does it like remove socialism? Does it do any of these magical things? No. Um, I'm seeing the in, in these urban centers. Um, fear. Like, yo, if you're not thick skinned, I don't give a f about anybody's like thing because I understand freedom like you're, you're not going to like scare me until I'm supposed to like unfollow Don Jr. No, like I'm supposed to like not hang out at the White House when I feel like it. No, if when I get invited. <laughs> the thing is, I don't I don't I don't have that fear factor, but the, the general public, man. Especially first time voters, this whole pro like it's like first time gun owners. It's like, I don't know what to do. And the people, the elected officials, the, the pollsters, the trainers, are the people that you're supposed to look to to guide you through that process based on a system of balance, truth, justice, reciprocity. That's interesting, and I want to pause there because you're talking about the American experiment, and that's that's really important because the American experiment, as you mentioned, is one of diversity. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people can come together with different backgrounds, different cultures, um, can look differently, uh, and it's okay right. here in America. Right. And yet I have found that it stops short when we're talking about diversity of thought. Right. I'm unapologetically black. I un unapologetically support conservative principles, and that's, that's the no-no here. Right. You're not allowed to be black. People should be able to watch. Watch this, look at us, and know exactly what we think. Yeah. You should not be 
unapologetically pro 2A. That's not that's not supposed to be allowed here in this country, and we're seeing a big push for that. Right. They would assume that both of us have leftist opinions about everything. Right. And when I take a look at that, I think that what dictates a lot of that is culture, mm -hmm. black culture in particular. When we start talking about fear, why people are fearful to come out and say, hey, you know what? I disagree with that idea, right. despite the color of my skin. Right. Right. I find that a lot of our black idols and the people that are at the forefront of the hip hop community make it not okay to think differently. And I want to see how you feel about that. Those aren't black leaders and that's not black culture. The, the biggest trick that, the, there was a movie line, I'm a movie buff. The biggest trick that the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. They've convinced people that this is your culture. They've convinced people, like, uh, you know what black culture is? And I know some people might be mad at me, but I still watch the Cosby show. The Cosby show is black culture. Okay, you're allowed to do your thing, there's freedom. Dad's going to say, Theo, you tripping, but you're doing this. And we get you, you want to wear a Gordon Gartrell shirt, whatever. But you're going to get an education. You're going to be informed. We're going to have a family unit. We're going to do things as a family. If you want to speed it up, I got a sitcom for you for every generation. If you want to talk about, you know, uh, one of the Wayans brothers had a show uh, where he had a family. That is black culture. Hard working dad that runs this company that has, you know, put together a family unit with children. That is black culture. Hip hop back in the day talking about serious issues and presenting solutions to them is black culture. Complaining via hip hop is not black culture. So what happened? How did it change? Because I grew up same way, watching Family Matters was my number one show, The yep. Winslows. Yep. I loved watching Steve Urkel turn into Stefan. Stefan was smooth. We gotta bring back Stefan, yeah. so he's a real <laughs> yeah. smooth character, yeah. right? right? So what happened? What happened was um, hip hop culture being the most powerful voice and medium got co-opted. It got co-opted and turned into a commercial. It got co-opted and turned into um, a prison to pipeline situation. You know, it, it became, we can, it, it, when hip hop turned into mind control and you're, you're I'm, I made way more money, right? Um, selling things lawfully over the last few years than anything that I've sold unlawfully, allegedly over, <laughs> you, you know? I love that you dropped in the allegedly. Yeah. But that's, a, that's, that's because I was a victim of my own ignorance and accepting a social con construct. Somebody fed that to you. You know, you went from, I remember, I remember the line when it happened and, and going back in hip hop history, when Dr. Dre said, it's, it, ain't, it ain't no black fist, it's just that gangster glare. That was your line. Dre's a billionaire now. Jimmy Iovine at that time, Owned, and I, it's not a knock. I like Jimmy Iovine. I like Interscope. I still listen to Snoop's old stuff, right? Jimmy Iovine owns 60% of black music. That's not black culture. You've been fed something as a falsehood, and they fed to you. They, they, they played to your insecurities because you, if you was in the same area, they also told you what poverty was. Bro, you, like, fast forward to today. You got an iPhone. You're not poor, bro. Like, I've been to parts of Jamaica that the family does not have a front door. Don't tell me about your, your Wi-Fi connection. You know, and so what happened, um, hip-hop culture being the most powerful form of expression on the planet, they saw it as a, a takeover. They gentrified it. You know, I, I've considered that. Um, in terms of this NFL protesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many black Americans were upset that at the end of this, uh, Jay-Z ends up doing a deal with the NFL. And I have said to people so many times, uh, Jay-Z is a lot smarter than you. Right. And somebody privately said to me is that Jay-Z has always been a drug dealer. And what, it doesn't matter, like, it, you know, now he does music, obviously he's not physically selling drugs like he used to back right. in the day before he became famous. But he is still selling drugs to the black community because he's he's constantly getting behind these causes that tell us that we should be upset. Colin Kaepernick, half white man, kneels, and now he can't get a deal in the NFL. Be upset, be outraged, be protest, don't go to the NFL games. Um, and yet 
He's doing deals. He's getting richer. I say to people, did you get richer by getting on your knees when somebody sang a national anthem? <laughs> did you get wealthier by being That's upset hard. over? I mean, I, but seriously, the yeah. same people get richer off of the same protesting. And yet you're supposed to say, ah, Jay-Z has our back. Here's the thing that I, I love Hove as a, as a, Hove is the American dream. Mm. Let me tell you why I say that. From nothing, practice. I'm, I'm, I'm against the war on drugs. I think that the Portugal model makes sense. You can do whatever dumb thing that you want to do with your body. That's retarded. But you can do it. Like we said earlier, I feel you. I hear what you're saying, but it's stupid. Libertarian perspective. You have a right. libertarian perspective on when you say war on drugs, you mean like we should not make it illegal for people to smoke pot. Is that what you're right. saying? Okay. So, so for example, with him being, I'm selling stuff that you stupid people mm -hmm. want to buy. Right. You see he's on heroin. Six months later, you know what he's you're going to look like because you saw what he looks like in six months. So I think that for the same reasons why I felt for about 10 seconds last night after we got beat up in this election, for about 10 seconds, I felt like, man, this is why people just give up. This is why, like, yo, I, I've laid it out for y'all. The, the Democrats are lying to you. It's not I love y'all, but they're lying. That guy right there that I love is lying to you, and I love you too. But you still voted for these same things, right? Um, for that second, I understand why somebody would sell drugs to somebody in that space. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. And I, I had this moment. I, I, I met, um, it, was, it was Dr. Ben Carson. I was speaking to him years ago in his office, and I was talking about this, and there were a couple of other people in the room, and somebody in the room had offered that as you go on this journey, Candace, there are going to be moments where you doubt your own people, where you just go, you know what? I'm telling you, this is the secret to life, right? right? This right here, a little bit of conservatism, you can do anything in this country, and it's great, and people will still refuse it. And then sometimes you get that moment where you go, you know what? Take the drugs. Yo, it's like my man, Zukan, he's a producer. He, he said, come on. At the time, I was a vegetarian. I've been vegan and raw foodist for like, I was a vegetarian for 10 years. Sorry. Yo, it's, it's great over here on this carnivorous side of the table. Mm. Right? So <laughs> the thing, though, is um, he was like, Maj, like, yo, let them, like, he was on his Marie Antoinette. Like, let them eat cake. Let them eat whatever thing that they want. We're going to have this, this high-grade, you know, quality foods and things because... Even if you try to give them the fruits and vegetables, bro, they're not, they're not going to drink water. They're not going to drink water. And it's like, so to the NFL thing, I was disappointed. I, I stood with Cat. I get what you were trying to say. I get that he got with a vet and the vet was like, yo, that's your freedom to do so. I might not do it. People wait for me now at like events. They wait for me to like take a knee. I'm like, nah, bro, I can't. If somebody come in here and try to shoot something, I'm not taking a knee. I'm going to be right in position. So that's one. Two, I'm like Leonidas. I, that knee thing, I, I can't really submit. That's a form of submission in my view. That's no different than hands up, don't shoot. I will die about mine. I've made that commitment. So that whole knee thing, but I understand. Objectively, I understand what you're saying. You're bringing attention to this thing, tying into the whole BLM thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, let's, let's pause there. Yeah. What? objectively, do you agree with, with that? What are, what are they drawing attention to? I, I think that um, during that time when he was doing it, was that five years ago now at this point, four or five years, there were a string of back-to-back um, -back, um, murders of American citizens that happened to be melanated. Hmm. Um, it seemed like almost like in the hood, it felt like you couldn't get through a week. Now, now wait, now here's, here's the other thing to that. Now, that's devoid of the other data, because I don't say one thing without the other information. Right. And that's why I, it's like I don't I'm always somewhere in the, in the middle because yeah, how can you how can you and sorry to cut you off there, but how can you objectively agree with it when you know that's actually that's a subject that's a subjective agreement. I, mm. You could agree with them subjectively like, oh, I felt the same way looking every night on TV. It mm -hmm. felt like it was happening felt every like. night. But then objectively, right. you look at the facts and you realize I just used it. white men are right. being gunned down now faster, Hispanic say. men are being gunned down faster. So actually, objectively speaking, drawing all this attention and creating all of this conflict mm -hmm. between black Americans and cops led to what? 
Now, An increase. No, no, no. So wait. So here, now here's what I saw. In homicide. From, here's what I saw from it. I didn't play it as they happen to be. I understood because I'm in the hood with these same people. These are my people. And I know what channels you watch. And I'm like, bro, you should like not watch that. <laughs> That's one. But I, but I'm, I empathize. I understand. But at the same time, I'm going like, I didn't go, yo, well, it's black people. I went, there is an American being killed by law enforcement, and it seems to be going unchecked. Now, if I get you at black American, African American, whatever, I'm going to take you over to Spanish American, white American, and then I'm going to go, hey, white guys, you should be just as upset about this because you guys actually statistically are more likely for this to happen to you, too, because we're all Americans, right? That's the power thing. So when I'm in a, a Second Amendment thing and it happens to be all white dudes, I can find a commonality there. And then I'll also say, like I say to all of my conservative friends, like, yo, you're ignoring urban America because we become victims of the same brainwash. There is no term called white on white violence. Right. And so to me, it becomes, all right, how can we use this as a unifying thing? And I'm going to get my white homies, my law enforcement homies. Our first Black Guns Matter class, I had street dudes that was still hokey pokey, one foot in, one foot out. Mm. Tattoos on their face, smelling like a pound, came to the situation. My events are Switzerland, bro. We neutral. My friends come in. Yo, oh, what's up, baby? How you? Da 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 da. Mind, you know, it's cops in there. Yeah, he's. He's a uh, retired state trooper. He's current law enforcement. You, he's, well, you know I got that thing on me. Everybody in here has that thing on them. Come in. And I see everybody size each other up. Towards the end of the event, all of the you know, beginners leave. The gun people are chopping it up. My criminal friend that will give the shirt off of his back that I'm trying to desperately pull out of that life is now giving the state troopers advice on switching out their triggers. We got something here. Because now that's how we're going to improve those police community relations. Mm. All right. So I once got in trouble because I made the statement that if I, and I say get in trouble, I mean the press, which I could care less about. Um, but I made the statement that if I made a list of 100 things that were negatively impacting the black community, a top 100 list, police brutality wouldn't make it. And I stand by that statement. Right. So I find that this the conversation surrounding, uh, you know, Colin Kaepernick, the kneeling and all that stuff actually creates more problems than it solves. I mean, mm -hmm. literally diet would be above police brutality. Right. When we know the number one killer in America, heart, heart, heart disease. Right. And, and we know eating habits and weight and all these issues. That would be a bigger problem facing black America. Yeah. Um, medical mistakes would be a bigger problem. We know a quarter million people of a year, way more than people that die by mistakes that happen in the, in the police, through the police borough, yeah. are being killed by doctors by accident when something goes wrong medically. Right. We don't see any protests or riots about that. Right. Why? It's not sexy. Mm. It don't, it don't like sell newspapers. It don't get ad revenues popping. Mm. You know what Race I'm saying? Race sells. Race sells. And like calling, race doesn't necessarily sell, calling things racist sells. Ignoring the things that are actually racist. When you have a, because again, for me it was, it, for my conversation with Black Guns Matter was always tyranny. I don't care what your melanin content is. If law enforcement officers are killing the people, our founding fathers wasn't with that. It was, yo, you're going to respect the people. Like the whole thing starts out like we the people, like not like, yo, can we kind of like, please have, you know what I mean? And so for me, the conversation was never, I don't care what you, I got white homies that got killed. And it's like, I've been beat up by police and I'm not going to pretend like that bias and that media um, training of telling white dudes that the black dude in the hood is the bad guy. It exists. I, there's, there's a small section of media that once a tower of Babel. Well, I mean, a small section. I, I was trying to figure out um, turning on TV now, because we had already talked about the Winslows and what we grew up watching. Turning on TV now, how are we presenting ourselves on TV? I can't find positive black TV anywhere. Right. right? The number one show in black America is love and hip hop. Right. That's about strippers, rappers, trying to make it in the music industry, gangbangers, fights, 
Um, so how can we be surprised when you're dealing, if, if there is a person mm -hmm. who has no experience within the black community, didn't come from a black family, uh, didn't grow up in the hood or the projects, goes into that community and you don't know what to expect. Yeah. You are going to rely on what you've been trained to believe is the community that the media told you. Now. I did the same thing the first time I went to a country club. Right. I had never been there. The first time I went there, I was like, this is going to be stuffy, right? People are going to be tons no. of spoons no. and forks. No. And, yeah. I, my, right. my instantly, I said, whatever the media says is yeah. what I'm, I'm going to be walking into. That's normal behavior. Right. So we do have a responsibility to be careful of how we're allowing the media to portray us Overwhelmingly, and I think, I think that's overwhelmingly negative. I think that I, I know it's overwhelmingly negative, and I think that even if if we tie it back to Kaepernick, the first explanation that he gave. So it's two things. I I was with Cap until a certain point, or that, and I'm using him as the like the thing, right? I was with you when you first explained it. This is not about disrespecting the flag. This is about da da da, and that's your reason. You have that right to say that. What you lost me was you, you allowed somebody else, the media, to hijack your messaging. And you was running around. You didn't help with running around with pigs on your socks. You didn't help there. Right? Then. It's, yeah, you can't say that's talking out of both sides of your mouth. Right. right? Then you can't say, and I know some of my friends going to be mad for me. I, Cap's born day was last week sometime. Um, you also can't say, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to fight this. Then you take the bag of money. I have to maintain and keep that same energy. I'm objective. I'm criticize, I'm going to criticize when criticism, criticism needs, needs to happen. And I'm going to applaud you when it needs to happen. I think it was brave of him to do this thing, but I think he didn't, he didn't really, perfect example. There's a reason why the first few years of Black Guns Matter, there's no video of me with a firearm. Because the, one of the very first media hits, uh, stories that we did was a media hit. They asked, um, the photographer was there. And he's, you know, how do you safely load and unload a firearm? Well, if I'm appendix carrying, I do this, blah, blah, blah. Show them all of that. What's the wrong way to do it? We make a joke about it. Yeah, it turned us sideways like the television tells us. Click. That's the picture that they use. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, no. Even the font is different. The wording and the pull quote. So for me, it was, okay, I have to be responsible with this superpower of leading people that I have. It's not going to be, you're not going to see me shooting. You're not going to, no. It has nothing to do with the firearm. That responsibility to your messaging is where I, another reason why I think Cat failed. And I think that the media blew it out of proportion. And there was no one, because we had got caught up in that black versus white, so forth. Everybody stopped going American. Everybody stopped going tyranny. Everybody stopped going, yo, law enforcement officers with the job that they do, they are sometimes a victim of that same bias. People in the hood are still a victim of that same bias. I've had so many law enforcement officers. I got friends that's cops. They hate that word, by the way. I have friends that's officers. My street friends are not going to tell me that he's a bad dude. That's my cousin. Mm. He will, he go outside every day to catch robbers, rapists, and stop homicides. Just like the, my law enforcement officers are not going to tell me that my dudes that's, you know, doing whatever they're doing, Oh, they're just bad guys. No, you're not going to tell me that. And so that balance there is what we didn't have somebody translating that going, yo, I see what he's trying to say. And do you see what he's saying? To say? You need to understand what she's trying to say, too, and figure out. Because we all we, we getting caught in these subsects and it's Americans should not be killed by law enforcement officers unjustifiably. Law enforcement officers should not be killed by Americans unjustifiably. I have a weird take, and I'll say that my, my personal opinion of Colin Kaepernick is that he's tremendously uneducated, a completely ignorant person <laughs> who caught a wave, uh, you know, kneeled uh, with very little information of how often this even happens, because mm. if he really cared about black lives, he'd be fo focused on abortion, black on black violence in the hood. He cared about none of those things until it became a mainstream false narrative. He got, he got on his knees um, when they sang the national anthem, and it became sensationalized. Um, and then he realized that portraying himself as caring about black issues 
brought a lot of money towards him, so he picked his hair out into an afro and said, you know what, forget that half white side of me, I'm going to go full black, mm -hmm. and uh, he made money. And unfortunately, we so easily, the people that suffer are the same people, the people that now have to deal with the unrest that's between the police community and black America are the same people. Colin Kaepernick was a rich person who got richer, um, and he laughed all the way to the bank. Now, call it a weird take. What? What? what I will. I will. But if he actually cared about black lives, he would come debate the, those his points on stages that disagree with him. And I've said this to that. you starting over. Yeah. The one thing about me and the one thing about you is that our beliefs hold true enough that we will say that whether we're in a room full of people that are on the left right. or on the right. right. Colin Kaepernick stays where he's safe because his arguments about police will be absolutely destroyed. And he talks out of both sides now, of his mouth. Now, I agree with that until to the extent that I can't speak on what his intent is. Because like you said, he doesn't... When you wear pig socks... Your intent is no, pretty clear. No, don't get me wrong. You I, got pig socks? I, I don't have pig socks, mm -hmm. but I've been in fights with law enforcement officers that I, you're wrong. I don't care about your uniform at that point. Right. We have, a, we, had a, we have a code of conduct. We have a standard as Americans that you are going to respect me. I'm going to respect you. The problem is in urban demographics, because we're not politically uh, engaged as much and, and involved in the civic process, there's, there's the, the, let's say if it's the two bad cops in the precinct, right, or in, in that particular precinct. If you keep running into those same two cops because they on your shift when you get off of work, it's going to paint that picture. Then you got the media there. So I'm not going to pretend like they ain't bad apples. It is. At the same time, um, when you're talking about cat, man, you got to be able to you got to be able to stand on what you say and what you do. Again, I, I'm say this in front of anybody. I don't care. I'm strapped. I go everywhere for the most part with a gun. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to pretend like it's about anything other than protecting my life against tyranny. Right. So I'm not going to act like I'm Democrat and not say that just because I'm running for city council. I'm going to stand on that truth. and I'm going to be able to explain it a thousand times if need be. He fell short there. Here's the other thing. And again, I, maybe it spun out of, out of control for him. You didn't you didn't know. It's like you ever get a remember. Do you remember when you first followed me on Twitter? No. OK. You first followed me on Twitter. I know you're married now. I was like, yo. Who's this girl, Candace? She's hot. And all of my followers were like, oh, bro, you got to. <laughs> and you were like, yo, that's actually worth a follow because it's hilarious, but I'm in a relationship. I'm like, cool, you're dope. Boom. The, I didn't know that that would spiral in that direction. When I started Black Guns Matter, it was one event. I didn't know it would spiral into this direction. I think that Cat did something that he talked about and he, he made a statement and it spiraled. Mm. Now you're responsible for the spiral, baby. Just like football, you do it. You're responsible for that tight spiral. I don't know how much money you settled for. I know it's money. Now, I do know that you gave away a million dollars to people that were doing the work. I do know that. He probably paid more in taxes that year. Right. Now, if I have an undisclosed amount, the question mark for me with Cap in that scenario becomes, if you got an undisclosed amount, I need to see some of that money, baby. I need to see that money. I'm willing to look. Look, bro, he, he, Tyler Perry wore a wig. I'm never wearing a wig. Tyler Perry turned that wig into a quarter of a billion dollar studio. Talk all you want about that. He's hiring people. He's creating jobs. He's actually the American dream. Mm -hmm. I'm not wearing a dress, though, but that he was cool with it. My point to that is I can see what he did with the money. Cat, I got to go. If I'm being critical, I got to say, bro, I, I need you to drop some of them bags of money off more than a million dollars. I've done magic with raising over the last three years. We raised a quarter of a million dollars to keep these classes, um, keep the financial barrier to entry for someone that wants to learn about the Second Amendment, about proper firearm safety training, conflict resolution, de-escalation. I raised a quarter of a million dollars and I gave it away. All of it. So if you got an undisclosed bag of money and if I don't see a $2 million facility, if I don't see a $10 million facility, I have to, I have to be, bro, it, look, it starts to look like it was about the paper. Well, the facility is probably called his house. Oh, that's <laughs> tough. Don't do that to Sorry, me, just saying, just saying, got to call people out. I, I, I saw it straight away. Now, 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 that's here's, my opinion. Here's, here's my devil's advocate to you. If he drops the $10 million community center, not just a basketball court with a tennis court outside, technology, you know, um, open, yo, come do Blexit here. Mm -hmm. Would you be open 
And would you go, okay, I see what you did. That this now starts to make some sort of sense. Because I, I need I need to see something for the chaos. I mean, honestly, I always say, if, if I believe people are genuine, if I perceive them to be genuine, even if they're genuinely wrong, mm. I'm okay with it. Mm. And a great example of that is my conversation with Killer Mike. Mm. I agree with Killer Mike on so many things. Mm. I don't get how he arrives at socialism, because you know he supports a socialist yeah. candidate, and I'm yeah. an unapologetic capitalist. Right. But he is the most genuine. He will have an open discussion. He will yeah. meet you here. He will go there. He'll be on any stage. Yep. I don't care if you arrive at something that I perceive to be wrong. If your motives are right, yeah. I'm okay with it because then we can have a conversation. Right. Right. When you don't want to have the conversation, you're yeah. boxing yourself in. Yeah. I, I, I believe you to be a snake. So yeah. that's my opinion. Yeah. Um, we have to wrap up here. And we wrap that. up every single episode by allowing you to leave a message for the world. You're going to look into this camera and okay. you're going to say whatever you want. We're going to put two minutes on the clock. Okay. If you could, if your words could fall in everybody's ears in yeah. the entire world, what would they be? Are you ready? Yep. World, I give you Maj Toure. What's up, world? Um, I want you to be educated. I want you to be safe. I want you to be responsible. I want you to purchase firearms. I want you to get proper training. I want you to study world history. Hitler was elected democratically. He didn't like take over. He was elected to that position, you know? Um, he de-armed an entire population or section of people and then proceeded to murder them. Hitler is not the only example of that. Um, you got, you know, communist regimes, socialist regimes all over the world. So this isn't no new thing. Every 40 years, people forget what happens with socialism and then, oh yeah, Venezuela. Um, so I want you to not fall victim to that. I want you to support the people that are doing the work. I want if you if your personal commitment right now cannot be that you can do it yourself. I want you to link with and support people politically, socially, financially, whatever that are doing that work that affects uh, positive change and steers this idea, this experiment of uh, freedom and liberty in the direction of freedom and liberty. If not. If you're hearing this conversation and if you're not willing to do that, you're not a part of the solution. You're a bitch. To Ray out. <laughs> wow. I thought I was going to say you're part of the problem. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.